all of us who are involved in the management of intracranial aneurysm should have a reasonably good idea about the management of vasospasm. Since a large number of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have vasospasm and a significant population would also end up with delayed cerebral ischemia which can have devastating consequences. Now when we talk about aneurysmal SCH, we know that the treatment today that has to be offered is prompt securing of the aneurysm. After the initial phase, patients may deteriorate and this could be either because of hydrocephalus, sepsis or a low sodium but it also can be secondary to vasospasm and thus we need to be aware of it and should be ready to treat it. Now the definition of delayed cerebral ischemia is an occurrence of a focal neurological impairment like hemiparesis, aphasia, apraxia, hemianopia or neglect. And there should be a lowering of the Glasgow comma scale by at least two points and this should last for at least one hour. Now this is not apparent immediately after aneurysm treatment. In other words, if you have a deficit immediately after the aneurysm treatment when you extubate the patient, it only means it is a procedure related complication and cannot be attributed to vasospasm. And uh, once you have ruled out an underlying cause, then we should start confirming the diagnosis and confirmation of the diagnosis with vasospasm is seen secondary to subarachnoid hemorrhage in 40 to 70 percent of all the patients or in other words except for the very mild SCH all the others will have vasospasm and also we should know that 17 to 40 percent of people who have vasospasm will end up developing symptomatic vasospasm where the patient actually will have a deterioration in the clinical condition or there will be a deficit. Typically vasospasm will start on the third day. It peaks by the seventh to the tenth day and usually lasts on the fourteenth to the fifteenth day. But rarely it can persist much longer. And like I said, the vast majority of the patient with a grade three S or more of SCH will definitely have spasm but the thing is it counts. Now let's just have an overview at what causes vasospasm so that we can direct our treatment more towards this than anything else. For example let's have a look at this brain it looks like a very busy slide but technically it's not as difficult as it looks. This is the brain and we have a vessel that is ruptured out here this is the one. The RBC will come into the subarachnoid space and as they come, the wall of the RBCs will lice because they cannot stay, the integrity will not be intact in CSF and the hemoglobin will become, uh, will come out of the corpuscles and start floating freely in the CSF. This will join along with the haptoglobin and form a hemoglobin haptoglobin com complex which is now floating free in the CSF. At the same time, the hemoglobin will react to the vessel wall as it reacts with the vessel wall, it indirectly stimulates the endothelium. The endothelial receptors will then get activated and will actively tag on or integrate the macrophages and the neutrophils onto it. Once this happens, this macrophage neutrophil complexes will actually slip out from the endothelial lining, come out of the vessel wall and this hemoglobin haptoglobin complex will go and attach itself to the CD163 receptor and this will induce apoptosis of this macrophage. Now the macrophage once it lyses will release a series of chemicals called the, called the endothelins, the free radicals and the cytokines. Now these are called the phosphodiesterases and other kinins. Now all of these are responsible for producing vasospasm. So remember, if you really want to treat vasospasm, 
we should prevent this whole thing from happening. We should prevent the cells from escaping out. We should prevent the cells from lysing. We should neutralize the chemicals as soon as they're released out. And we will talk about this in little detail very soon. Remember also, in people who die, 42% of the people who die of SCH have vasospasm, whereas it is just 18% of them who do not have vasospasm. So we understand that a very large contribution to death in subarachnoid hemorrhage even today is vasospasm. So how do you manage vasospasm? We can just divide as preventive and therapeutic. What is the preventive steps we take? We give nimodipine, it comes as tablets, give each of them a 60 milligram. We give about two tablets every four hours. And if the patient is uh, cannot tolerate it, we give it six hourly, uh, that is four times a day. Along with that, we ensure that the patient is euvolemic. It's extremely important. What we aim is euvolemia. There should never be dehydration, but there should never also be overhydration. So when a patient is with us, the patient is reasonably conscious, we do a procedure, and we come and see the patient a, a couple of hours later or maybe the next day. And if you find some of these signs, it must alert us that probably the patient is going for spasm. For example, what are we going to see? We will sometimes see a patient having hemiparesis, hemiplegia, or loss of sensation or numbness. We can have a patient having confusion, dizziness, difficulty to speak or inability to speak, a worsening of headache. A mood change. Suddenly a patient who was pretty calm becomes very agitated, wants to get out of the bed and walk, tries to pull out the lines. Blurred or double vision can also happen because of sub subhyaloid blood which happens in SCH but one should not rule that out and should always always investigate. And of course a patient may become suddenly or progressively unconscious which is also uh, one of the findings associated with global vasospasm. So how do you confirm? Do the electrolytes rule out hyponatremia? Do the cell counts? Ask for a procalcitonin to rule out sepsis. Once you have ruled out this, image the patient. A transcranial Doppler can give us a direct or an indirect evidence that the patient may having spasm. A CT brain will rule out a fresh bleed, increase in edema from a hematoma or hydrocephalus. Now, if all these are not contributory, we have to do a CT angiogram or take the patient for an MR and do an MR angiogram. But a CT perfusion is a new kid on the block and offers enormous information and also gives us an idea about the prognosis. Extremely important that we understand this aspect today that overhydration kills and the triple H no longer contains hyper, <clears throat> uh, 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 does not in, includes only hypertension and we do not induce hemodilution nor do we allow the patient to get overhydrated, which can be very, very dangerous. Look at this study. All of them clearly show us one thing against the odds ratio that the people who actually uh, were not treated with overhydration did better than the one that were over, overhydrated. Among all the studies that we have, just one study shows no benefit and all the other studies favored patients who did not have increased volumes induced by giving more fluids than necessity and keeping a very high uh, positive balance or keeping a CVP of more than 12. So it's an important fact. So we ensure that patients do not unnecessarily get plasma expanders and albumin and uh, uh, with the aim of keeping the fluid circulating volume high because this can actually produce cardiac failure, not only cardiac failure, we have understood that it actually produces cerebral ischemia because it reduces the delivery of oxygen to the brain. It's important to understand, it actually does more harm than good. It actually induces uh, more of ischemia because there is reduced uh, transfer of oxygen to the brain tissue and that should never ever take place. So how do we uh, treat delayed cell with ischemia or symptomatic vasospasm? <clears throat> For first line of therapy, is inducing or augmenting the blood pressure with non-adrenaline. We had increased the systolic pressure all the way to 200 to 220 in these patients, keeping the volumes optimized with crystalloids targeting euvolemia. So for example, if the IVC looks collapsed on an ultrasound or the CVP is less than six, you would ensure that fluid is brought up so that the CVP comes around eight to 10. At the same time, 
we would induce hypertension. When this does not work, we would take the patient up for endovascular therapy. It could be uh, balloon angioplasty or intraarteral vasodilators in the form of intraarteral nimodipine or intraarteral mildrenon. Also, the cardiac output is augmented. The hemoglobin is kept above 8, somewhere around 12. And if this doesn't work, we do uh, therapeutic hyponatremia. Uh, Intrathecal vasodilators can be tried. Also, we can try intraortic balloon pumps. But between uh, you and me, none of these really work. And if we are not able to salvage the patient with uh, uh, endovascular therapy, then probably we are going to we are fighting a losing battle. Also, we like to discuss this drug, mildrenon. Mildrenon, though it has been introduced for cardiac causes, may play a role and we think if it is used early, may actually be able to prevent symptomatic vasospasm or at least severe vasospasm. Basically, mildrenon is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor and like we said, right in the first 24 hours to 48 hours, there is a lot of this being released because the macrophages keep lysing. And we'll talk about In 1971, we discovered that phosphodiesterase was there in the brain tissue. By 1978, we found that uh, uh, aminophylline and papaverin and ascorbic acid could be used for vasodilatation. In, in uh, 1997, we realized that phosphodiesterase 4 was predominantly there in cerebral vessels and mindelnone was seen to produce uh, vasodilatation. In 2001, we have some papers where they use intraarterial and IV mildenone with uh, definite angiographic evidence of vasodilatation. Then 22 patients were treated with mildrenone in uh, 2008. Intraartal mildrenone was tried as a rescue therapy in 2009. And in 2012, we have a case series of 88%. We're not saying it changed things to a great extent, but it did offer help in a certain subset of patients. But we will talk a little more about should mildrenone be started a little earlier very soon. But what is the current mildrenone protocol? Now, this protocol is basically uh, uh, come from Canada and it's the, uh, the Montreal protocol, which is the most popular protocol currently for mildrenone. So if you want to start mildrenone in a symptomatic patient, ensure that the CVP is more than 6. Mildrenone is started at 0.5 to 0.75 micrograms per kg per minute. If the BP is below the baseline, in, ensure that you start non-epinephrine along with that so that the MAP goes up at least to the previous level but idly somewhere around 100. If there is no improvement, increase the dose of mildrenone. From the 0.5 you started, you can go all the way to 1.25 micrograms ensuring that the MAP doesn't drop below 90. If there is still no improvement in 30 minutes, take the patient into the angiolab and do an either an angioplasty or try an intraarterial infusion of these drugs to induce vasodilatation. With all these studies, we still cannot say that we have got an answer for vasospasm. A paper in 2016 which compared all the studies finally concluded that we have only low evidence. But then the fact is, sometimes when we have nothing else to offer and the patient is deteriorating, mildron may be the only drug that you have and you can try it. Now, what is the protocol that we have been trying at the Kobe Medical Center? To highlight once again, we talked about the fact the problem came from these macrophages that come out and they release these uh, chemicals into the subarachnoid space, which induces vasospasm. These are the endothelin, the free radicals, the cytokines, all of them regulated by the phosphodiesterase. Now, we know that we have to use something that can utilize this. What is the advantage of mildrenone? It directly works on the smooth muscles, causes vasodilatation. It has got an inotropic effect on the heart. It decreases the release of neutrophil elastase, which in turn is important to prevent lysis. It reduces apoptotic signaling, so the neutrophils and the macrophages do not lyse, do not lyse the, uh, release the chemicals reduces the markers of inflammation, reduces platelet aggregation. In other words, we got something that seems to solve a lot of problems. And that's how the Montreal Protocol was basically 
uh, uh, based on this fact that Milrinon probably has answers. But remember, this is given in patients who already have got vasospasm, not as a prophylactic measure. It's the same thing that we talked about, rule out other factors, avoid hypovolemia, correct uh, hypothermia, hyperglycemia, hyponatremia, ensure that the magnesiums are normal, start Milrinon at uh, point. 1 to 0.2 milligram per kg as a bolus. <clears throat> now, we don't give this at all because we found it induces a lot of hypotension when it's given along with nimodipine. So, we directly do the infusion of 0.5 micrograms and raise it all the way to 1.25 to 1.5 over a matter of 1 to 1 and a half hours if there is no benefit. And this is exactly what they have said and if this doesn't respond, take the patient for an emergency angiogram. So what do we do for any patient who's got a grade 3 or a grade 4 fissure um, SCH? We check for hypokalemia, arrhythmias, hypotension. It's important that you rule out arrhythmias because mildrenone is contraindicated in arrhythmia. We start them on an um, IV mildrenone infusion from day 0 or day 1 when they come. The same dose, 0.5 to 1.5, build it up to a level where we can actually uh, ensure that... Uh, uh, the BP uh, or the blood pressure doesn't drop. Now, in this cluster that we have been talking, we were only giving mildrenone. We were not even adding nimodipine because sometimes the BP would drop enormously and it becomes difficult. And in this, we would step up the mildrenone, ensuring that the MAP did not drop less than 100. And simultaneously, we were also giving the patient uh, non adrenaline, especially after the aneurysm was coiled. So, we do continuous BP monitoring. We monitor potassium every day and replacement if necessary, monitor for arrhythmia. We do a TCD on day three. We do a TCD on uh, every alternate day after that. We do a CT angiogram on day seven. Now, this is a protocol study that we did, but just let you know that what we were following, we actually started seeing something interesting. In a certain patients, we did not see spasm, but some of them did have spasm. But in about the 100 patients we have seen so far, we did not have very very severe symptomatic spasm except in one or two so it's too early to say if this is going to help but still it's a con it's a concept that we have been looking at purely considering the fact that mildron has so many beneficial factors but probably should be started before the symptoms develop now how do we load mildrenone? Whether you want to use it as a prophylactic measure like what we do in our center or a therapeutic measure as they do in the Montreal study, it is always the same. Take one ampule of mildrenone. It contains 10 milligrams in 10 ml. Reconstitute the 10 ml with 40 ml of normal saline. Now you have 50 ml. That is 5 ml contains 1 milligram of mildrenone. In a 50 kilo patient, the dose of 0.5 to 1.5 will come to 7.5 to 18 ml per hour. So you start at 7.5 ml per hour, keep building it up every few minutes till you get the optimal blood pressure and maintain that. And the same thing in a symptomatic patient. So if it is a 60 kilo, it's 9 ml uh, against the 7.5 ml. So you can understand, you can easily build it up based on this and an easy way to follow. So let's show you a case presentation and the things that happen and how we went ahead with each step of the treatment. This is a 45 year old female. She has come with acute onset severe headache. She doesn't have history of trauma. We do a plain CT and this is a thick SAH, no intraventricular extension, but definitely there is enough of uh, uh, blood in the basal cisterns and we would start them with the protocol that we uh, have talked before. So zero is no, one is minimal, two is minimal with bilateral IVH. <clears throat> Up to this point, we don't expect severe spasm. One, it is grade three, is thick SAH, filling one or more cisterns or fissures without IVH, and four is the same with IVH. So this was a three, and we are expecting spasm in this. But remember, the risk factors for spasm are these, thick subarachnoid blood, intraventricular hematoma, Persistence of arachnoid clots, pure neurological condition and admission, loss of consciousness associated with rupture, history of cigarette smoking, pre-existing hypertension, diabetes and cocaine use. From all this except for cocaine use, every one of these are common in India. And also, I, we want to emphasize smoking. Heavy smokers are very, very prone for uh, spasm and we have seen it all the time 
and i think in these are people where you should think of mildenone even before the spasm develops preferably from day one we do an angiogram the left side vessels are normal the vertebral artery is normal uh, sorry the right side vessels were normal the vertebral artery is normal and uh, the left uh, uh, ic injection shows an a1 a2 junction and neurism so this is the 3d angio it shows that uh, there is a daughter aneurysm that is pointed anteriorly and superiorly we also can see that both the acas are uh, incorporated into the neck of the aneurysm so though the neck is not very wide it's preferable to keep a balloon out here and that is exactly what we did so this is the working angle remember your working angle should show the neck well it show the origin of both the vessels well lest you have a complication have a look at that this is the lateral working angle and this is predominantly taken in this case to show an end on view of the balloon so that you don't get into trouble so for example here are the images with the balloon you can see that little bump at the neck which clearly shows that the neck has been fully occluded and covered and the lateral view like i said helps you to see the patency of the vessel as we do the procedure this is after the procedure as you can see it's a perfect result we got an excellent um, uh, coiling of the aneurysm but the fact is what happens after this now the patient did well from day 1 to day 10 and this is the time when you expect actually the spasms to start dipping but anything can happen in these patients he was an oral uh, Uh, nibonipine and we had also given him uh, some iv mildenone to just uh, ensure that uh, the patient was uh, uh, protected from spasm uh, was an aturostatin was having levipril once a day adequate hydra hydration and dvd prophylaxis now this some people we give this combination of oral nibonipine and mildenone when they are hypertensive otherwise we can actually avoid nibonipine completely if you start mildenone early on day 10 the patient has transient upper limb numbness he recovers and uh, after we induce hypertension and gave nonadrenaline and braced brought the systolic pressure to somewhere around 200 now whenever we have a patient with deterioration we do a ct the reason we do a ct is to look for increase in edema if there is a hematoma is there a rebleed from an aneurysm remnant is a hydrocephalus infection and ventriculitis especially if you have put an evd hyponatremia is done by blood test hypoxia can be seen in the same changes especially on mr it's more pronounced then you may have cortical spreading depression so if nothing works please do an eeg you may see the patient is having continuous seizures which is not picked up then of course cerebral vasospasm cerebral ischemia a tcd will sh uh, will show changes if the velocity the mca is more than 120 there is spasm if it is more than 200 is severe spasm but the problem is hypertension can induce the same thing so it's better to take a ratio between the internal carotid uh, versus the middle cerebral artery and if the middle cerebral artery velocity is more than 3 times of the internal carotid velocity then it suggests severe spasm and you have to still image and do something else So the best imaging to do is either CTA or MRA or if possible do a perfusion study. Now if the narrowing is less than 25% it's mild, it's moderate when it's 25 to 50, when it's severe when it's more than 50, but on but actually for what we have seen is when it goes above 75% it really can be bad and become symptomatic. So we talked about this before we need a drop of at least 2 in the GCS to tell that the patient has got a, a neurological deficit that warrants uh, uh, further imaging and to say that this is dci that is delayed cerebral ischemia symptomatic vasospasm is usually gradual you have a patient gently deteriorating from a conscious state to an unconscious state for or a mild hemiparesis going all the way to hemiplegia but you to pick it at the time when the symptoms are mild so that you can have a much closer monitoring the ct in this patient as you show does not show hydrocephalus the mr shows a small little infarct which may or may not be symptom of secondary to spasm because this can even happen during the procedure we know that 
And this is the vessel, how it looked before the treatment. This is the vessel, how it looks after treatment. As you can see, there's bilateral uh, spasm of the, uh, it looks like there's bilateral spasm of the ACA with spasm seen in the MCA. So since there's radiological evidence of spasm, but the patient has improved with hypertension, we do not do anything. We don't proceed further. We just keep the patient under close surveillance and the patient actually continue to do well. But on day 13, there is another drop in GCS and there is right-sided hemiparesis. She was shifted to the ICU. Then we do a CT and a, uh, and a CT and what do we see? We see the spasm has definitely progressed. So we do a CT perfusion and what do we see here? There is reduced cerebral blood flow in the whole hemisphere on once on the left side with an increased transit time. This is very, very classical for spasm. And once you have got that, we know the patient has got further worsening in GCS. There is severe spasm on CTA. CT perfusion shows there is spasm. So we know that we have got reduced perfusion, increased mean transit time. We cannot wait and watch any longer. We do a DSA. We can see that severe spasm in the A1 and the A2 on the left side, the severe spasm in the M2 web branches on the, on the left side again. And we know this is the reason why the patient is deteriorating. So one of the good options in this case is to angioplasty. You can actually prime the patient with a vasodilator. The problem with vasodilators have to be repeated multiple times. Uh, we rather chose to go ahead and do a balloon angioplasty. The balloon that we use is a Skepta C, not the XC. The C is a better option over here. We just want dilatation of the vessel. So the balloons are long. So we take a 20 mm one so that we can dilate the full length. So we need a 70 m long sheet. They take a guiding cat, take a, a good wire, whatever is your choice. We use either the synchro or the Traxxas and then have a balloon. Everything should be in good condition and give nimodipine as an infusion, give 5000 heparin and you can dilate. I can see this. We can dilate it incrementally all the way up. You can see the balloon dilating up the way to the M2 branches and on the uh, A1, A2 junction again, and this is the end result. This is how we started on your left side. On the right side is the vessel looking nearly normal. We also angio and see the opposite side. The vessel looked pretty good. We did not have to intervene over here. And on clinical follow-up, the patient continued to do well. So this was done at 10 or 11 in the night. So remember, sometimes spasm has to be treated like acute stroke. The window period you get may not be so long. You may completely lose the patient. You may have a permanent deficit, a reversible brain damage where you can't do anything. It's in medical emergency sometimes, like you see there's deterioration, we show evidence of severe spasm, and that window is the time we go in and intervene. So we kept the patient in hemodynamic augmentation, continue to improve clinically. We could discharge the patient with no deficit, and in one month follow-up, the patient was absolutely normal. To summarize, so if you have a patient, do an early aneurysm repair, keep the patient euvolemic, give the patient oral nimodipine, avoid hypotension, optimize the ventilation, and uh, if you can, and make sure that the ICP is maintained, and that could be even done with the help of giving hypertonic saline if there is some edema. Once there is neurological deficit, it's important to rule out other causes like septicemia, electrolyte imbalance, and if that is ruled out, do a CT and make sure that you can rule out a rebleed, a hydrocephalus, an infarct or increased edema, and then go ahead with vascular imaging if these features are not seen. Vascular imaging in the form of CTA, MRA, and CT perfusion, and keep the patient euvolemic, induce hypertension and hemodynamic augmentation. If there is no improvement, you have to take the patient to the angio suite and do something about it, either angioplasty or intraarterial vasodilators. But intraarterial vasodilators have to be repeated several times. Balloon angioplasty is a better option if they are focal, it's limited to the basal vessels and the distal vessels are still open, but it's very diffuse. Or maybe you have to combine both balloon angioplasty with intraarterial infusion. Along with that, sometimes it's a good idea to keep the patient on low molecular weight heparin because sometimes there is associated distal embolization. Also, we talked about the role of mildrenone, still under investigation, but we in our center feel that probably starting mildrenone early, maybe even day one, day two, may actually reduce the ill effects of phosphodiesterase 4 
and uh, can probably prevent the uh, lysis of the macrophages and the leukocytes in the subarachnoid space, probably reducing the amount of chemical that has been released. Now, these are hypothetical at the moment. It's interesting, but maybe in the next couple of years, we'll have more answers to this very, very difficult problem, which still continues to haunt all of us who are involved in the management of endovascular repair of aneurysms. So, uh, thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope it has been beneficial to you. It will be good if you can put a little feedback of your own experience uh, and let us know what you feel about it. Thank you so much.